Aloha, everyone. Welcome back. Um, this is our last session of what I think has been a very interesting and informative and exciting series of 12 presentations. And I, I just want to take a minute to thank all of the presenters who have been a part of this. Um, I think they've, they've all presented clearly, presented factually, and given us a lot to think about. So today, our pule will be um, done by Dr. Puakai Lima Davis. Aloha, my kako. Well, let's join in pule together. Thank you for having me to do so. Papa Makua's blessings too. Thank you. Well, a pule kako. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious day and the wonderful blessings upon today's session as we launa and gather together as points of light for you, Lord. And let us open our hearts and minds to the blessings and knowledge that you have prepared for us through our speaker today and Mr. Donovan Preza and all our Vala Ao sessions that's to come. Uh, we are ready to dive into this final session with the blessings of all the past weeks, as Linda has said, and to walk away with an experience to halia aloha and to remember and share with others. You have so much blessings in store for us, Lord, as wanohana o kiakua, and we lift all of this in your name, makainoa o yesu Christo. Amen. Mahalo. Hey, aloha mai kako. Um, aloha. Welcome back for the last presentation of four in our land series. Uh, today's presentation is on the Kuleana lands. Uh, if I can just do a quick overview. Um, presentation number one was the Great Mahalayan Overview. And in that, we learned how the 1839 Declaration of Rights and 1840 Constitution <laughs> secured the Maka'inanas and other classes, Konhiki and government's rights in land. And it was through that document that we found there were three classes having rights in land. First, the government, second, the chiefs, third, the native tenants. And so our second uh, presentation focused on the government lands. And in that presentation, we saw that the Maka'inana uh, were large purchasers of those government lands. Uh, purchasing approximately 167,000 acres uh, of government lands through royal patent grants. Um, in week three, we took a look at Konahiki lands, but more specifically, we looked at the king or crown's lands. And we used the metaphor of um, Donald Trump and Trump Plaza and made a differentiation between the private between private lands and public property. Uh, Trump Plaza belonging to Donald Trump, the individual, even though he served as president um, and made a distinction between public lands belonging to the United States, uh, your national parks, for example, or the White House. And today we're going to focus on that third class, right? There are but three classes having vested rights in the land. First, the government, second, the chief, and third, the native tenants. So today we're going to be looking at the native tenants or, or the Maka'inana's rights in land. So in this graph that uh, the Kuleana Award are that white portion of the pie, all right? And if you just look at this one graph, it looks like the native tenants did not get land, right? Because that small white piece of the pie is so small, right? The To the right with the kind of more lighter yellowy orange piece, uh, that's the king's lands, the green being the government lands, and the peachish orange being the on the left being the Konihiki lands. And that white portion is the Kuleana Awards through the Kuleana Act of 1850, approximately 28,000 acres of land. John Record in 1846 wrote, means and remedies may be altered, but the rights themselves, if vested, cannot be constitutionally disturbed. This is one admitted doctrine of civilized jurisprudence, 
Another of, his, of its admitted doctrines, even in the exposition of new law, that the old law must first be understood and the mission to be cured by it in order to apply the remedy, right? And I, I think this is an interesting quote for a couple of reasons, right? It talks about, hey, you got to understand what was going on at that time that they were trying to fix, right? That they were trying to improve upon uh, if you're going to try to understand. You, if you want to understand the new law today, you got to understand the old law of yesterday. All right. But um, for those uh, who may be more astute for land right issues, there's a very powerful sentence there. But the rights themselves, is, if vested, cannot be constitutionally disturbed. Right. So what does that mean? Right. So this is where the significance of vested rights is is really important. A vested right is a right that you cannot, that a third party or an external party cannot take away from you. You have to voluntarily divest that right yourself, right? So this is what they're talking about when those rights cannot be institutionally disturbed, right? And we're going to see some court cases and some language that expound on this. So this idea of vested rights, right? And this comes from the 1846 Principles of the Land Commission, there are but three classes having vested rights in the land, right? And there you get that sense of vested, vested rights. So here we have the Kulian Act of 1850. And um, the official title is an act confirming certain resolutions of the King and Privy Council passed on the 21st day of December, A.D. 1849, granting to the common people allodial titles for their own lands and house lots and certain other privileges, right? So this law does not come into effect until 1850, right? If we take a look at section one, that fee simple titles free of commutation be and are hereby granted to all native tenants who occupy and improve any portion of any government land. If we read section two, I know it's kind of grainy for you guys, but it basically says the same thing except be and are hereby granted to all native tenants who occupy and improve any lands uh, other than those mentioned in the preceding resolution by the king or any chief or konahiki, right? So section one covers government land and section two covers the, all of the konahiki lands, land held by the king, any chief or konahiki, right? So this basically if, is most of Hawaii, right? If you're on land owned by the government or if you're on land owned by the chiefs, and those are those two classes that had vested rights in land. There are but three classes having vested rights in land. First, the government. Second, the chiefs, right? So section one takes care of the government. Section two takes care of the Konohiki lands. So basically all of Hawaii, the native tenants had a right to divide out and get their interest, right? Um, section three is important Because prior to this point, the land commission was just a board that investigated title. They could not award title, right? The title, they were investigating that people got proper title from the person before them. Then in 1850, section three, the board of commissioners to quiet land titles be and is, here, is hereby empowered, which means they did not have this power before is hereby empowered to award fee simple titles in accordance with the foregoing resolution. To define and separate the portion of lands belonging to different individuals and to provide for an equitable exchange of such different portions where it can be done so that each man's land may be by itself. All right, so there's an important context just to understand the land commission and when their role shifted and when their role changed. 
right? The problem we have today is that we understand the Land Commission backwards. We understand and think that what they were doing in 1850 was their job in 1846, rather than understanding, hey, what were you doing in 1846? Then what do you get? What responsibilities got added on in 1848? And then what responsibilities got added on in 1850? All right. So, and this is all related to the idea of there was a deadline for for the land commission to file so the land commission came into power in 1846 and they put a call out in the newspaper and said that all individuals uh, whether natives or foreigners with a private interest in land need to submit their um, application that was in February of 1846, and the deadline was uh, February 14th of 1848. This law here does not go into effect until December of 1840. It's not written until de uh, December of 1849 and goes into effect in 1850. Right? So this is the confusing part about the Land Commission because in order to act upon this 1850 law, a maka, maka Ainana would have been required to have filed by February 14th of 1848. How do I know that I'm supposed to file in 1848 when the law that empowers me to get title is not written until two years later? And that's the question that people haven't been able to understand because we've understood the Land Commission's role backwards. We assumed that they were looking at Kuleana Awards the entire time when they looked through different kinds of awards. In 1846, they had a role in responsibility. In 1848, we saw that they were then empowered to look at Konihiki Awards. And then here in 1850, through Section 3, they're empowered to award fee simple titles to Kuleanas, right? So this is where the confusion with the Land Commission and Kuleana Awards all comes in. And hopefully some documents that we look at later will start to clarify that. Section 4, that a certain portion of government lands in each island shall be set apart and placed in the hands of special agents to be disposed of in lots from one to 50 acres. In fee simple, to such natives as may not be otherwise furnished with sufficient land at a minimum price of 50 cents per acre. This clause basically says, if you don't have lands through other means, then you may buy land directly from the government in lots from one to 50 acres for 50 cents an acre. Can we please bring this law forward to today? I'll pay whatever 50, the equivalent of 50 cents is uh, in 2022 monetary terms, right? But I, I think this is the kind of important part, right? For me, the big distinction with the Mahele is the the mindset of the government. The Hawaiian Kingdom government used the land as a way to manage society. And they did so in a way where they were trying to get people on the land, evidenced by Section 4. If you don't have land, come buy some from us if you want some up to 50 acres for 50 cents an acre. You can have 50 acres for $25, right? And we saw in uh, the government lands presentation number two that Hawaiians did that to the tune of 167,000 acres across all of the islands, right? You have a, if you have family land from the 1850s, you have a better chance of having land from the purchase of government ends than you do from the Kuleana Act. 
just by acreage. So back to kind of this difference in government, right? In, in the eight, let me put it another way. If the Hawaiian kingdom government was in charge today, I don't think Hawaiian homelands would have a waiting list the way it does today. People would be on the land as evidenced by this section four of getting people on the land, right? That was the whole point and that was the whole purpose. In 2022, the Hawaii state government is managed, is run by people with land. All of the large landowners come together to control government and control policy and control other things and manage the rest of Hawaii. And for me, that's the major difference. Today, those with land manage Hawaii. In the Hawaiian kingdom, land was the thing that was used to entice was the incentive, the price, so to speak, right? And it wasn't hoarded. If Hawaiians wanted to hoard land, Kamehameha III would not have made private property to begin with. He would have kept all 4.2 million acres for himself. Right? The whole point of the Mahele was to create private property so that in the event of imperial con conquest, those lands would be respected. Right? Section 5, in granting to the people their house lots in fee simple, such as are separate and distinct from their cultivated lands, the amount of land in each said house lot shall, ex shall not exceed one quarter of an acre. This is another important thing. We have a contextual difference in perception in 2022 and in 1850. In 1848, when they did the Mahele, land was looked at for its agricultural use, not for its house lot use. In 2022, we all want land so we have a house over our head so that we can rent it out and Airbnb it and do these other things to make money from the residents. In 1848, it was all about the agriculture, right? So Kamehameha III himself says, hey, when we're doing this Mahele, this is a division of agricultural lands, not house lots. Right, So you have to keep in mind that in 2022, our perspective is entirely different. We're worried about house lots today, right? Because a, a piece of land with a house on it, I can sell for a million bucks, right? Never mind growing some pumpkin and selling that for $10,000 every year. Let's go put a house on it and make a million bucks, Right, so there's there's a, a difference in perspective in 2022, and this is where that house lot one is important, right? Because it limits the size of the house lot to a quarter of an acre, right? But your agricultural lands could be two, three, four, five acres, whatever was in use at the time. Section six, in granting to the people their cultivated grounds or kalo lands, they shall only be entitled to what they have really cultivated and which lie in the form of cultivated lands and not such as the people may have cultivated in different spots with the seeming intention of enlarging their lots, nor shall they be entitled to the wastelands. All right, so section six is talking about you can only claim what is in use. All right, and so this is your perspective on the Mahalais. If you think the Mahale is a foreign imposition, if you think the Mahale was bad, then you probably read this as a way to limit how much land a Makai Nana got, right? If you look at this from a traditional perspective, it makes sense, right? You could not, you were not entitled in traditional times to more land than you used. You were only entitled to what was in use and what you made productive. Right, and that's how the system worked. So I actually think this is a very Hawaiian value, but when you look at it through, oh, the Mahel is bad, the Hawaiians didn't get land, this is how they kept lands from the Hawaiians, then you're going to read and interpret that section very differently. Section seven is basically PASH, right? Public Access Shoreline Hawaii. You can pick tea leaf, right? When the landlords have taken allodial titles to their lands, 
The people on each of their lands shall not be deprived of the right to take firewood, house timber, aho cord, thatch, or tea leaf from the land on which they live for their own private use should they need. Right? So here's the gathering rights clause. Right? And I don't mean to sound uh, sarcastic in, in my comments about Section 7. It's just that in 2022, the state of Hawaii's perspective has limited subject to the rights of native tenants to mean you can gather. Gathering is only one of seven sections of the Kuleana Act. What happened to section one? What happened to section two? What happened to section four? Right? How come subject to the rights of native tenants gets narrowly defined to mean just section seven. And we'll go over this in a, in a second. So here we have all, all seven sections of the Kuleana Act um, for those who haven't read it all through before. Um, and this is what a Kuleana Award looks like very different in form than a Konehiki Award and some of our other kinds of awards. You'll have the date, Honolulu, October 16th, 1854, Helu 4491, Tukua Pu'u in Kaneohe, Ko'olaupoko, Oahu, right? This is the information from the previous award. Here's the page number, page 355, and you have uh, descriptions, upon a one, upon a two, and these are the different pieces, right? Because you could have a house lot and a lo'i. And they were often uh, non-contiguous, not next to each other, right? And then within that, you will have a survey description. Uh, he pahale makula luluku. Illegible ko'olau poko oahu, right? A ho'omaka make beginning at this point going 29 degrees, hikina 1.27, and it'll give your call outs for the surveyors, distance and direction. And then it'll have on the bottom head 2.66. What I think is probably acres there, and then you have these survey drawings to describe these different lots. Uh, so upon a one description will be here, and upon a two is probably there. Right. So th this is what the Kuleana awards look like. Keep in mind, today we are only looking at the blue section. Right, which corresponds to that white section of the pie. In presentation number two, we covered the green government lands. In presentation number three, uh, we covered the orange or the king's lands. And the rest of the Konehikis and native tenant uh, Kuleanas will show up in the yellow through land commission awards. Thrums Annual uh, has land statistics. I believe this is from Thrums Annual, 1895, page 36. But here you get a breakdown of the acreage uh, by island. And for Hawaii Island, you also get the breakdown by district, right? So if you take a look at Puna, you see that Puna, Hawaii had only 32 acres of Kuleana lands. And this is what uh, Deviana McGregor in her book, Na Kua Aina, pointed out that um, the, according to her analysis, the people in Puna did not get land. They only had 32 acres of kulianas. And those 32 acres went to a couple of foreigners mostly, right? But still, it's only 32 acres. But what we learned in... Um, the second presentation was that Hawaiians purchased over 16,000 acres of government land in Puna, right? So the people of Puna did not go landless. They just bought land via 
or patent grants directly from the government because the majority of Pune was government land uh, rather than uh, getting those lands as land commission awards, right? So here we have the 28,000 acres of Kulianas and breakdown by island. Here you have the indices, the index of land commission awards highlighted in yellow are those three parcels that add up to those 32 acres, right? 11.3, 13.6, 7.3. Those are the three land commission awards that are quote unquote from the 1850 Kuleana Act. The rest of these awards for Puna Hawaii, and there are more on other pages, are Konohiki Awards. So if you were to look at the Mahele book, you would go and see that William C. Luna Lilo got Kahawa Le'a, um, which is 26,000 acres in Ahupua. You'll see that Vic Victoria Kamamalu got Kahuai, which is 2,869 acres. You'll see that Kanaina got Kapoho, which is 4,060 acres and so on and so forth, right? Uh, Hazalele Kalama got Puna, 2,902 acres, um, so on and so forth. What I'm trying to point out in this slide is the differentiation between Kuleana Awards from the 1850 Kuleana Act and the Kuleanas that the... Konehiki got via the Mahele book, right? In Nahoa Lucas's Dictionary of Hawaiian Legal Land Terms, there are, there are, I believe, 14 different definitions of the term kuleana, right? So that means there are 14 different legal contexts in which the word kuleana is used. So it's a very nuanced word. Right, it just doesn't mean the same thing in all instances, right? So I use very specific language when I'm talking kuleanas. So when I say kuleanas, I say kuleana from the 1850 Kuleana Act, kuleana, right? So the only kuleanas in this from the 1850 Kuleana Act are those three highlighted in yellow, while all the other awards on this page would also fit one of those 14 definitions of kuleana, right? So just for you to be aware that there are multiple definitions of kuleana, and sometimes you have to be specific with what you mean, because we kind of just throw kuleana around a lot. So question being, subject to the rights of native tenants, have they been extinguished? Right, so the common perception today is that Makai Nana were required to file their claims by 1848, February of 1848, and if they did not, then those claims are extinguished, thus leaving us with just Section 7 of the Kuleana Act with the gathering rights. Right, so the state of Hawaii today would interpret subject to the rights of native tenants as meaning you have the right to gather tea leaf, aho cord, and peely grass. Right, whereas in 1850, subject to the rights of native tenants meant you had a right to, as you were um, living on. two very different things, right? I have a right to the house, to my house lot and, and farmlands versus I have a right to pick tea leaf. If you look at the records of William Little Lee, these are available at the Hawaii State Archives in series 240, right? Series 240, records of William Little Lee. If you look at January 14th of 1848, you'll find the letter that says this. 
I agree with you that the subject of prolonging the time for sending in land claims is worthy of serious consideration, and I will take the first opportunity to bring it before the king in Privy Council. The tenants, however, will not lose their rights should they fail to send in their claims. For I will see that no Konihiki has a title to lands except upon the condition of respecting the rights of tenants. The tenants, however, will not lose their rights should they fail to send in their claims. All right. So William Little Lee, according to William Little Lee, if a tenant did not submit their claims, their rights were not extinguished. This is a 180 degree different interpretation than our 2022 state interpretation. January 12th, maybe that was a typo. January 12th, 1848. Should the tenants neglect to send in their claims, they will not lose their rights if their konihiki presents claim. For no title will be granted to the Konihikis without a clause reserving the rights of tenants. But to preserve the rights of tenants in their lands is not all we seek. We seek not only to preserve their rights, but to measure them and give them such form and shape that they may always know what they possess. And so... There's a bunch of different court cases here. Um, I've highlighted a bunch of them. We have that quote from John Record, 1846, means and remedies may be altered, but the rights themselves, if vested, cannot be constitutionally disturbed. William Little Lee's letters in January of 1849. Um, the, the tenants, however, will not lose their rights fail to send in their claims. And then this conversation is had in these, on December 21st of 1849. And that's when you get these resolutions that are adopted for the Kuleana Act of 1850, right? That's that December 21st, 1849 Privy Council uh, conversation that the Kuleana Act uh, names in its title. Right. Also in Privy Council, July of 1850, we must first define the rights of the common people. And so this is where you start to see that the rights of people to land was a separate issue from their right, from them having vested rights and ownership interest in the land from the Constitution of 1840. Right? There are but three classes having vested rights in the land. First, the government. Second, the chiefs. Third, the native tenants. That was a right to own land. Then after they started to deal with that, then they realized, well, if these people just have land, but then all of their rights, their rights to water, their rights to all of these other cultural things aren't articulated, then they're going to be stuck and they're not going to be able to survive. So that's that conversation in July 13th of 1850. We must first define the rights of the common people. Those rights of the common people they're talking about are the right to water, is the right to gather, is the right to access my property because right, we didn't have landlocked property. Everybody acknowledged rights of way and other things, right? We didn't have that strict American no, you can't cross my property without an easement mentality. Okay. So that those are the types of things that start to get addressed in that July 13th, 1850. But that should be clearly distinguished from subject to the rights of native tenants, which is speaking to the 1840 constitution. There are but three classes having vested rights in the land, right? So this, hopefully, this should give context to a court case like Kikieki versus Dennis in 1851, where it says not even the king could convey away the rights of the native tenants, right? Not even the king could convey it away because look at John Record, means and remedies may be altered, but the rights themselves, if vested, cannot be constitutionally disturbed. 
right? So Kiev, Kiev versus Dennis tells us the king can't convey away their rights. John Record tells us the constitution can't disturb the rights of the people, but somehow in 2022, the state of Hawaii can. And this is where the misunderstanding exists. And this is where the clash of paradigms, right? This is where the Hawaiian kingdom was using land to manage people, whereas in 2022, people with land are managing people, right? You have two different paradigms going on, two different ways of running government. And that's kind of the, I think, the hugest distinction because those who control the interpretation control the law, right? And we see this after the overthrow, the Committee of Safety went, went directly to the judicial. They did not move until they had uh, Judd in their pocket. They approached Judd, who was the Supreme, was the Supreme Court. Uh, until him, they did not move on the overthrow because they knew he was the guy that could get them persecuted for treason, right? And this is the importance of the interpretation of law, the judiciary department, right? It's, it's no accident that the Committee of Safety went first to secure the judiciary. Today's a short one. I'm ending early. I figured I would give us more time to ask questions. I figured people are going to have lots of questions with this one, and it's one that our presentation is hard to get at all the nuance. You have. There's a thousand things you have to read to get all of the background for Kuleana lands. Well, thank you for that um, overview for us. Um, let's start with this question here from the chat. Um, they said, was Little Lee trying to protect the land of native tenants because Konohiki were trying to take those lands? You do have those stories. Um, and those stories are true. I don't, um, the, some Konohiki were not hip with these changes that were coming. Um, just as some Konohiki were for the abolishment of the kapu system and other chiefs were not, and a war was fought over it, right? There was not consensus on all of these changes. Um, but um, there were a handful of chiefs who were. But I think the more important part is all of this was codified in law, right? This It, it wasn't left to just be custom. And by custom, I mean non, like, hey, this is what we culturally did, but we didn't write a law about it, right? The 1839 Declaration of Rights and the 1840 Constitution protected the Makai Nana, right? Uh, let me find a quote real quick. I have it here from a court case. This is from uh, Bruins versus Mott Smith, 1877. Those of you interested in royal patent grants, this is a very important uh, court case regarding royal patent grants and their effect. Um, but in this, the court makes a statement. Um, it must have been contemplated that the original parcels of land would in no long time be subject to be, be subject to division by partition among heirs and by sales. Here's the important part, which for the first time in Hawaiian history, a common man had the power to make. And we can hardly suppose that it was meant that the right to acquire complete title should depend in its exercise upon blah, 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 right? This court case acknowledges that the 1840 constitution is the first time that the Makai Nana become land managers. Right. For me, this is huge. This is like structural change in Hawaiian culture. Right. No time before 1840 was a Makai Nana a, a land manager in the context of large parcels of land. Right. You were in control of your house lot and and your farm. That was it. Right. Now you could buy and become a land manager. You were essentially 
after 1840, the Konehiki and the Makainana, that distinction between them with land management, gone. All right. So um, yes, a lot of Konehiki did not take well to that, and there are those stories. Um, but I don't know how pervasive those stories are. Right. There, if is that one or two Konehiki and the rest fell in line? Um, you know, I, I don't think you make one example and generalize it to the rule, but you also don't ignore the one example and say that it didn't happen, right? There, there are documented cases that the Konihiki um, tried to shut down Kuleana claims. Thank you. Um, someone said, clarify the last thing you said, the committee of safety had to go to the judiciary um, judge, judge who was the Supreme Court judge. Yeah, so before they embarked on any of their illegal acts, because to to what they were doing was a revolution. Well, I have to choose my words carefully. What they were doing was potentially a revolution, right? But be, once you had the intervention of the United States, that changed the context. But what they were doing was treason and the Hawaiian Kingdom laws, treason, death, right? You you commit treason against the government, uh, you were hung, right? So they went to Judd, Albert Judd, and at first he wasn't buying it, but then, you know, it's basically, hey, you, you jump in with us and we got you, or you stick with them and we're going to, you're out, right? So he was basically made an offer he couldn't refuse, because he was the head judge, right? Uh, I think Ron Williams has a bunch of this. If Ron's in here, he can jump in on that one too. Um, that's more Ron's era of that 1890s era of research, but they, they basically secured Judd so that they wouldn't get hung and then had the guts to go do their action. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, does the 1964 Constitution make any changes in the land ownership? Um, nothing off the top of my head. The king's lands are still protected. Um, if you want to be a little more specific, um, but I don't, nothing is popping to my head, but I also haven't read the Constitution in the last six months, um, so. Um, was the, um, I don't really understand this question, but was the Luna, Luna Lilo land case uh, King Luna Lilo? Uh, the Luna Lilo, yeah, that was King Luna Lilo. Okay. The example that was in the Land Commission Award for Puna, yes, that land went to, that was King Luna Lilo. Great, and maybe I'll read this one since it's related to that. What happened to Luna, Lilo, Luna Lilo's land now? Oh, Luna Lilo's lands, how were they sold and by what laws? Uh, Luna Lilo, someone has to do that research. I haven't researched uh, Luna Lilo's lands, but my guess, and this is only a guess without any research backing it up, um, the Committee of Safety infiltrated all of the Ali'i Trust, right? They were the, if you look at the first five tree, five trustees for Kamehameha Schools Bishop Estate, I think three of the five were Committee of 13, right? Like they infiltrated every single Ali'i Trust. They were very politically savvy in how and what they did, right? So post overthrow, you're going to have a lot of committee of safety type people uh, in those trusts. And I know for Kamehameha Schools, W.O. Smith is selling land to Dillingham uh, and himself have a business and they're selling land to him in Dillingham. Waikiki, and that's how Waikiki becomes Waikiki, or part of Waikiki becomes Waikiki, right? Um, so it's all of the elite trusts need to be investigated to learn the story of when land was sold. And 
I, I may be off. Maybe Luna Lilo trustees started selling before the overthrow, but post overthrow, there is definitely stuff going on because they infiltrated all of those trusts as trustees. Mm -hmm. um, State of Hawaii is leasing out agricultural lots that are actually crown lands. Given the facts presented, how are they able to justify themselves as fee owner of crown lands? Because nobody asked them for the title, right? We're not asking that question, right? Like the I like like I uh th there was a family who was involved on Kauai. Uh, I won't say their names just to keep them private, but there was a family on Kauai that was involved in a court case on Crown Lands, and they sent me. Uh, something that Mahoy Collins had written up as they asked for a title report because they had watched my presentations and they had done their own research. Um, and on their own, they figured out that they needed to ask for the title report, right? If you're going to, if you're going to accuse me of trespass on crown lands, then you need to own those lands. Cause if you don't own it, then I'm not trespassing only the lawful owner of crown lands can get me for trespassing so that's basically the question they asked and um i got that document and in that document the land title report is severely lacking and that's to no fault of mohoy's if you asked me to write the land title report for the crown lands like you you're basically asking me to highlight the cloud on title right if I actually do the report right like and you know anyone in this room who doubts this like go get a go ask the attorney general for the state of Hawaii for a land title report to the crown lands that's it just basic land title report how did entity a get it to b and b to c and c to d and d to e and just get that report so that we can all look at it and we can look at it from a title perspective and we can see how the land's transferred. And I will guarantee you that in that 1890, 93, 94, 95 period, there's going to be a whole bunch of vague stuff. And that's exactly what was in the report, right? It was like, oh yeah, and then it transferred. Okay, how, right? And I, I'm not throwing Mahoy under the bus and this isn't Mahoy's fault he's to his credit he's the only entity i've ever seen or heard that has produced a title report for the crown lands uh when asked ironically right you would think hey just give us the title report that's like step one basic information but it also highlights the cloud on title so if i were in their shoes i wouldn't write one either right that's that you have the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself aspect but we got to write we as a people got to got to ask the right questions mm -hmm. right? and to this date we we haven't been asking that question we've been approaching it through overthrow and we've been approaching it through immoral and unethical and these other things which aren't wrong it's just a different question great great thank you was charles bishop then also participating in the Committee of Safety? Um, not directly, but um, to my, if if my facts hold correct, he he funded their, the Committee of Safety's trip to uh, America, All right? So like he wasn't, I don't know, this is out of my research. I don't know how direct he was, but I know he was complicit in that, in these other small ways. Um, that if I'm celebrating Founders Day at Kamehameha Schools, I think you should be celebrating Pawahi and not and not Charles Reed Bishop. That's just me. Got it. Thank you. Which transfer of lands are legal after the 1893 overthrow, and which transfers are not legal? Um, depends what context you want to invoke. Right? If if you're invoking international law, then everything's illegal post overthrow because there are no notaries 
and you're supposed to be be uh, in using the laws of the occupied country. Hawaiian Kingdom law requires notaries. There's no notaries from the lawful government, no notaries from the lawful government. All transactions post-1893 are illegal, right? But that's if you're invoking that context. If you're invoking another context, you know, who knows? But that would be the context that I invoke. And post-1893, it's all illegal. Section one of the Kuleana Act states that native tenants were granted fee simple titles from government purchased land. Is this only if registered with the Land Commission or any government lands purchased as we've seen in the prior presentations? Okay, so section one of the Kuleana Act uh, does not state from government purchased lands. It states you can get lands from, from the government, those lands that the government is in control of so to speak, right? The purchasing of government lands is uh, section four of the Kuleana Act. So if, if I got land that was held by the government, if I was living in an ahupua and that, and that ahupua was controlled by the government and not a konihiki, then I could go to the government or to the land commission and get a Kuleana award for those lands and I would have a land commission award. Section four of the Kuleana Act, if I don't have land, I can go buy land from the government, which would be a royal patent grant, fee simple purchase of government lands. And that's the 167,000 acres we saw in, in presentation two. Thank you. Um, in the Land Commission Award example, there was a list of large landowners, Parker, Harris, Sinclair, Bishop. Under what category do they fall? If Maka'aina um, could only buy up to 50 acres, how are these 7K plus acres lands sold and by whom? Okay, so Maka'aina, you could buy lots from one to 50 acres at a minimum price of 50 cents per acre via section four of the Kuleana Act. That did not bar you from making larger purchases. There were Hawaiians who purchased larger than 50 acres. If you did so, you would not be invoking section four of the Kuleana Act. Right, so section four of the Kuleana Act wasn't a limitation or a bar on the purchase size. It was um, an explicit thing that you could access through. You could also just go buy land from the government. Thank you. Um, is, is Hawaiian Homes Commission Act lands crown lands? Probably mostly yes. Um, and that's because most of the good government, most of the good government land had been sold, as we saw, six hundred and sixty thousand acres of government land sold by eighteen ninety three. So that's when the public, that's when the committee of safety, um, did what they did and confis confiscated or stole the crown lands, and so post. 1893, most of your, your military bases are mostly going to be crown lands. Your, the sugar plantation lands are crown lands. Most of what's distributed post-1893 is crown lands, generally speaking, because most of the good government land had been sold prior, right? And you have to take good into context for... Uh, location right if you're buying land in hamakua all those bridges we're driving over today do not exist right those are all built in 1914 and 1920 and 1930 so you have to keep that context of of what good means in 1850. thank you if a land title report shows a konohiki who holds a title to land and that konohiki dies without heirs who then will that land revert to if you die without heirs, um, no will, 
and no errors, then you would follow the civil code. We saw that in, um, I think presentation number three, it was first to your wife. Uh, it, it goes, I think third, it goes to your children, your children's children, then half to your wife, half to your mother and father. If no mother and father, then uh, I think the mother and father's brother and sisters. There, there's a whole if then hierarchy chart that gets followed. Um, so it would depend on like how how much you meet like literally without heirs or like my dad's brother brother's children or my dad's brother or my dad's brother's children don't have are are dead also because it it stays kind of in that line my dad if not my dad then my dad's brother kind of thing but i i would have to read the civil code i don't i don't have that memorized off the top of my head and I then in the worst case if absolutely no errors then back to the government okay thank you um is the kuleana and kuleana grant lands vested rights both the same jocelyn do you mean kuleana grant lands kuleana lands from section four of the kuleana act Yeah, give me that $11.78 an acre. Shoot, I'll pay 10 times that. Well, maybe while we see um, if Jocelyn wants to respond in the chat, um, we can go to the next one. When was the first, when were the first foreigners allowed to own land in Hawaii? So th this is actually a really interesting question because it brings up a nuance, right? Um, so foreigners could own land early. Aliens could not own land until 1850, right? And so this is one of those terms where they're very specific in the Hawaiian kingdom era. If you go look at Liliu and how she writes and how she describes people in 1850, she uses terms like alien. She uses terms like foreigner. In the land laws or in the uh, uh, naturalization laws of Hawaii, they use the term alien foreigner. Who wants to take a guess what an alien foreigner is? Right? Today, we just use these terms as like synonymous, like foreigner, haole, white person, or in the ethnic sense. But in the 1850s, all of these terms had very specific meanings that do not mean the same thing for how we use them in 2022, right? So in 1850, you had the Alien Disabilities Act. An alien is a non-citizen, right? So a non-citizen could buy land in 1850. Foreigners ha could buy land prior to or we're, we're, we have to be careful here, right? Because you couldn't really buy land before the Mahele, right? But um, foreigners held land, right? Foreigners were, a couple of foreigners were named as uh, Konihiki in the Mahele book, right? So they got land in 1848 via the Mahele. They were foreigners, right? So you would have to either be more specific with who you really mean by foreigners or if the aliens part um, suffices, then a, a non-citizen could buy land post-1850 and that was the Aliens Disability Act. Okay, do Kuleana Grant lands belong to certain Ali'i per se and were Kanaka able to live on Crown lands? So the Crown lands uh, in, in uh, presentation number three, we went over this, and the the crown lands, according to an 1864 court case, descended to, were inherited by the throne. So in the same way, whoever is the president of the United States gets to use the White House. This is where that metaphor falls apart for the crown lands. In Hawaii, 
you didn't inherit the use of the White House. You inherited ownership of Donald Trump's private property, right? So the crown lands were the private property of the monarch, and they got transferred to the next monarch. All right, they were inherited by the next monarch as private property. So they were stolen, for lack of a better word, in 1893, 1894, via the Constitution, Article 94, where they said, we hereby declare the crown lands to be ours. And that's where we have this break, right? And then with the overthrow of the government, you don't have a monarch on the throne. So strictly speaking, there is no entity currently that has a claim to the crown to the crown lands, right? That entity would be whoever is the monarch of a reinstated government would then have according to the constitution and according to Hawaiian kingdom law, right? And this is kind of the problem with those lands is we don't look at it that way anymore. We look at it as now, oh, these, but these lands could be used to benefit the Makai Nana and we could, um, like, imagine... A hundred years ago, in 1894, a million acres, 900,000 acres was stolen. And now the solution is going to be to give the Hawaiian people back that stolen property or give back what's left of that stolen property. And we're so hungry for change and for, for something because we've been occupied for 120 something years. Most of us aren't probably going to blink twice about when the state of Hawaii says, oh, yes, here, take the crown lands back. They're not ours, right? They don't belong to the Makai Nana. They belong to the next chief. That's like me saying I have a claim to, to Donald Trump's Trump Plaza. Why? I don't. Or I have a claim to any of the any of you individuals private property when you die i don't why do i have a claim to the crown lands according to this historical contextual understanding of who the crown lands descended to right if you want to talk well we need to remedy a historical injustice okay but that's a different thing than who do they belong to Right? If, if we had a monarch right now, they'd belong to whoever was in that position. Right? So this is where I worry that one of their solutions is going to be to give us back the crown lands and we're all going to say, yes, please. And then we are going to be left holding the bag. We're holding stolen property. Right. And that's going to be the solution. And it's going to be to, hey, yeah, let's go give them that stolen property so the Hawaiians can fight amongst themselves uh, for that. And I think that's more problematic. And I don't want our people to be in that situation. I think we should understand what the crown lands were. That's Thank just you. me. That's just me. Um, regarding the 1815 land. 1850, excuse me, lands and the Royal Court or Royal Patent Grant, were the rights possibly viewed as a different award and have different vested rights or have some limitations for the RP or have some limitations for the RP grants? That's a good question. I would have to think about this. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. If the 1850 Kuleana Act, 28,000 acres uh, versus those Section 4 Kuleana Act fee simple purchases of lots from one to 50 acres are the same thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Okay, thank you. 
Well, maybe um, for our final question today, I wonder, Kuma Donovan, if you can, I, I know you mentioned earlier, it's important the questions you ask. Do you have any um, kind of last questions or maybe ideas you wanna leave folks with as takeaways from your final presentation? Um, no, thank you for highlighting that. I think just keeping that mind, that question, like this really depends what questions you ask, right? And um, and what authority you invoke. One of the questions I always ask is by what authority? So you'll notice whenever I get asked questions, it's not my opinion. I put it back, well, according to international law, it says this. Well, according to this context, it says this. According to the 1864 constitution, it says this. But, you know, maybe you look at the 87 because you this or that, right? I think um, understanding that definitions sit in a context and to understand what that context is and that those definitions in 2022 are very different than they were in 1850. And to be mindful that when you have answers to, so you have all of these questions subconsciously that you ask yourself and you have answers to all of these questions, all of those answers kind of intertwine and, and kind of form, form your paradigm, right? Form how you view and how you see your perspective, your lens, and all those questions combine to entangle certain things. So if your answer to this question probably informs your answer to this question, which informs your answer to this question, right? Was the Mahele good or bad? Oh, it was bad. Why was it bad? Oh, because it was foreign imposed. Oh, how, you know, how do you know it was foreign imposed? Well, Hawaiians didn't get land, right? Like those things start to then intertwine and intermesh, which if you don't, consciously peel those questions apart and consciously ask yourself, you won't realize how intertwined and kind of automatic a lot of your responses are, even though you've like never researched or you have an answer for the question, but you, you can cite zero evidence for it. Right. And, and th those things become very strong right and 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 then also to realize like my my main way of interpreting is try to understand the mahele in the context of its time what would kamehameha the third say in his what would his interpretation be in 1850 because today we are often trying to write historical injustices right we want to fix a problem that's 127 years long just give me those damn crown lands, Donovan. Like, why are you going to sit here and deny our people those crown lands when that could be a viable solution? We can get people. And for me, because it's not Pono, it's not contextually right to an interpretation in 1850. It might be right to an interpretation in 2022 where we're trying to correct a historical injustice and that's the lowest hanging fruit and that's all they're going to give us. So that's what we're going to take. But that's a very different thing is, is that consistent with how it would have been interpreted in 1850. And so that's, that's for me, that's how I think, that's how I interpret things. And that may not sit well with people who have been struggling for a very long time and who want answers sooner than later. And I get it, but that's, that's where I sit. That's where I stand on, on those things. Well, um, mahalo nui kumu donovan for these great presentations. And I would encourage folks in the chat too to show your aloha and mahalo to him as well. Um, but let me pass it to Linda to wrap us up for our final session. Yes, thank you so much, Donovan, for, um, for trying to clarify for us what is a very complex um, amount of information. Um, thank you so much. You know, I wanna just, um, really briefly say where we've been in these 12 weeks. You know, first we had Dr. Keanu Sai, who talked with us about the development of constitutional law in the um, Hawaiian kingdom. Um, and then also introduced us to 
um, international law and that perspective of looking at the issues that we face today in, um, in trying to bring reconciliation and, and to do justice to make things Pono. Um, Dr. Ron Williams talked with us about um, the role of the church, particularly from the time um, after the original missionaries and um, helped us to, to see what the role of the church was also, um, that the, the grassroots church um, had in, embodied a lot of resistance while the hierarchy of the church at many times was um, aligned with the um, perpetrators of the overthrow. Then of course, Donovan has um, been educating us these last four weeks about um, the land and the issues of the land and understanding. You know, I think for me, some of the things that stood out through the whole session were um, understanding the very different perspectives that there may be around these issues. And um, how do we begin to talk to each other in um, respectful and curious ways to understand um, what, how we might come together and understand the truth of where we sit right now, how we got to there and, and what is the Pono thing that needs to happen now. Um, we got a lot of information during these sessions. Um, and I would really want to, I really want to encourage you, if you did not see all 12 of the sessions, I want to encourage you to go back and look at the ones that you missed because um, the sessions built on one another. And I think for me, the, the comprehensiveness of what was shared and what we can and need to understand um, is immense. And there's a lot of information contained in the um, sessions, which are taped, um, recorded, and are posted on the Hawaii Conference UCC website. Um, so if you haven't seen them all, I really want to encourage you to go back. I want to acknowledge uh, again, Kalani Akea Wilson, who is the person who recommended the speakers and was really um, very much a part of developing this series. Um, I'm uh, on my screen, I can see Ron Fujiyoshi and I know that he was also involved in discussions with uh, Kalani Akea, Akea on this. Um, so thank you for being with us. Thank you for being open to new information or um, to new understanding. And I hope that the result will be that we will have some really good dialogue in the future that will help us to find our way forward. So mahalo and mahalo to Cassie and to Kristen who have faithfully been here um, working with this session and making everything work. So ahoy ho.